I'm doubly honoured tonight as the uh, near teetotal and near permanent absentee recipient of the quake. <laughs> um, and also as the chair of the Education Committee um, to be able to uh, introduce Ed. I, I first met Ed in about my first week at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, when he was uh, leading uh, a panel session, you probably don't remember this, eh? um, uh, it, was a, it was an all-company partner roadshow um, explaining the performance for the last year, and as a cocky young consultant I pointed out that the two main indicators of performance, utilisation and recovery, were directly contradictory to each other and deeply unsystemic, and he was kind enough to, uh, to laugh from the panel. Um, and uh, talk to me about it later uh, and agree. Um, the only thing that was worse than that, he said, was what they had in TA consulting, which led to everybody being at each other's throats uh, all the time. And the, the next memorable thing about Ed was when we did a, a, an all-company um, training video on customer strategy and following customers around the um, customers, uh, as they were called, um, around the criminal justice system. So all of the computers across PwC, government and public sector, were equipped with a video training program, uh, the introduction of which was a head and shoulders shot of uh, Ed with the following audio. said, uh, this is all about what happens when the police catch a suspect, or scrope as they call it. <laughs> and finally, just to, just to end my personal recollections, uh, one of the things Ed told me, one of the great bits of advice was, don't be in too much of a hurry to reach partner. Um, which was ironic advice to a kind of young uh, executive too, yeah. as I was then. Um, because you think you get to the top when you reach partner, but then you discover that there are nine levels of partner, <laughs> and each of those has nine subdivisions. Uh, so, so um, uh, really deep experience uh, in uh, consultancy as a partner at Coopers and Librand and at PwC on the Global and UK board. Um, Ed also has experience uh, as chair of Demos and Relate, and specifically in government and related to politics. Not all of the Labour variety, but he advised um, on Thatcher's public sector reforms, um, on policy modernisation under Kinnock, and on the structure, the organisational blueprint of the Labour Party under John Smith and Tony Blair. Uh, it's a really great moment to hear from him uh, on why our constitution should be reformed and how. So I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Ed. Well, uh, consultants have been called many things in my career. And I remember The Economist in the 80s referred to us as the new witch doctors. Uh, things went a bit downhill then as uh, in the 90s and the noughties, uh, disgruntled public sector staff tended to treat us with derision. But I feel that now I've finally arrived because I'm now worshipped. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm very delighted to be here. I'm even more delighted to be here actually by some of the people I've met here. Astonishingly, one of whom I went on holiday with and a number of others at the age of 13 to Hungary. <laughs> I'll leave you to work out which that was. But David Miller, who some of you may remember, was a believer founder of the company and an early boss for me. Um, at the time I'd risen to what was termed uh, managing consultant in Coopers and Librand, and I asked him, you know, how can I improve my sales? You know, sales, sales, sales. Fail more was his short response. And I thought about that for a while, and I thought, well, yeah, you know how it hurts to lose, but if you actually internalize the learning as to why you lost, then you'll improve. Regrettably, 30 years later, this is a lesson that governments basically haven't grasped. Because as I've gone through my period of government, I've become uh, more and more convinced that there was something inherently wrong, regardless of the politics, because they seem to fail with such regularity, judged both by our expectations, but also, if you talk to them, by their intentions. Another way of putting that is, uh, as a review of the book said, 
Uh, the author addresses a deceptively simple question that has bedeviled generations of politicians and officials. Why does British government never work as effectively as we'd like it to? So that's a, another take. If you, you can have the soft version or the hard version. Um, I have been known to speak harshly in between outbreaks of diplomacy. <laughs> but let's take that question, take various cuts at it and see where it gets to it. In my view, if you take a cold, hard, apolitical look at major achievements of any modern UK government, and you'll find that that's mainly been to correct the mistakes of their predecessor, and actually on the ground little changes beyond that, and then they make their own mistakes. So if you take uh, a particular example uh, in the 80s, uh, all sorts of good things, I'm sure, but the Conservatives ran public services and the NHS into the ground. Labour then came in, returned these to at least the functioning, but spent too much, far too much, on the public sector. The Conservatives returned to redress the fiscal balance and to underfund the public services once more bit like being in a canoe. I term it zigzag government. You know, you go boom, 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 boom. I mean, there is a more efficient way to steer the ship of state. If you take public sector reform, um, all the while it rumbles on. Or does it, apart from its high costs? The NHS has been under perpetual reform, it's a bit like the Chinese Communist Party this, it's been under perpetual reform since 1981. Every government has reformed it on average once every four years. And yet, it still isn't finally reformed. And I remember a management guru, and I hope you'll find that all of this in the book comes very much from uh, a management consultant's perspective, a management guru is saying, look, if you go into a company and you keep taking cost out, and you keep restructuring, and you keep taking cost out, and then you take more cost out, and it's still not fixed, maybe you should look somewhere else. Maybe you should just have a look at the business model. And I think fundamentally the problem with the NHS is the model. And by the by, they seem to have a terribly good one in Singapore, quite a good one in France, one in Italy, one in Denmark. Should we perhaps be looking more broadly? The same goes in terms of public sector reform for secondary schools. You could move on and take legal aid. Uh, this is brilliant. Uh, there were three fundamental reviews of legal aid during uh, the 13 years of the last Labour government. Guess what happened after each fundamental review of legal aid? It went up. This government sensibly went after it, but in isolation. So, for example, you took uh, family law legal aid, squeezed it really hard, so the uh, lawyers working on the family side in an inquest, for example, will be paid uh, £450 a day and a really minimal flat rate for preparation. But on the other side, you'll have the police, and you'll have, uh, for example, a 30 grand bill legal aid, you'll have a 1.2 million bill for the lawyers for the police. Hang on, I think I spy a supply chain here. Someone has just taken a little chunk of the whole and gone for that. But actually, if we look at the totality of this thing, inquests we're talking about, there's far more money going, public money, going out of that than you just find there. And anyway, what's the point of an inquest? You know, you're trying to get some justice, but surely the point about an inquest is that you're trying to prevent a death in custody, particularly the shooting of Mark Duggan, uh, as an example, that triggered the riots in North London. Quite a costly outcome there. You're trying to prevent that happening again. You're trying to teach the police that that uh, is, is, is it, we should work in a different way. And then I think, well, actually, is an inquest the right way to do that? Is that a good way? What about air crash investigations? 
they seem to be quite an effective way of preventing failure. We've got preferential lobbies, um, which I appreciate some of you may well be part of and benefit from, and I appreciate that I have, but nevertheless we're in the grip of preferential lobbies. Why do they flourish? Well, if you put your consultant's hat on, you'll find eight conditions in a system of government each enable preferential lobbying, from decisions taken in private, exclusive access, particularly important is to make sure the civil servants and the politicians are ignorant of the subject in question, few restrictions on political party funding and so on. What do you find? Where do these eight conditions all exist? Just down the road in Westminster. Now we don't suffer as badly as they do in the States where it's quite quite appalling, but nevertheless, there are reasons why these things happen. I think this is all part of what I call U-shaped democracy. So basically, when an election's coming up, you get quite a lot of interest from politicians in us and what we want and all the rest of it. Election happens, and basically we're not here. There are many, many other interests. Um, so and we become rapidly ignored. Um, perhaps I don't know whether I'm allowed to say it, but I call this the vote and piss off system. <laughs> <laughs> then you've got our own experiences of government. I mean, there's a wonderful example here from some friends of Panchite entrepreneurs down in Glamorgan. Uh, tourism, tourist accommodation, heritage coast. This is all part of council's push. Economic development objectives for that. That they fit the bill perfectly. Please apply for a planning application. Brilliant. So apply for a planning application. This is supposed to be determined in eight weeks. But actually the critical report, which is from roads and traffic, uh, isn't actually prepared until some weeks, and it's supposed to be done first, some weeks after the end uh, uh, when the planning application is due. They then come along and say, ah, oh, yes, you've got to take out 120 metres of hedge and undergrowth. But it's March, and you all know what happens in March, the nesting season has started. So there's another department saying you can't possibly touch the hedgerows at this particular point. Further, the EU protected dormouse has become an issue for which they had to employ a dormouse consultant, even though none of the species has been recorded in the area. So, so forth. I mean, the left hand of the council saying yes, and meantime, the right hand is stuck in what I call the age of proceduralism, where what's your job? My job is to produce procedures. There is no headspace at all for outcomes or purpose. And so it goes on. I mean, you know, I mean, you'll have many of your own, but I mean, basically, many of these things, they're not... Uh, tabloid stories, but you just couldn't make it up. And little actually improves, really, on the ground. We experience asymmetric accountability, and we feel powerless to change anything. And then hardly surprising, I guess, that you get disengagement, disenchantment, and actually at times just dismay. You know, well, in my case, you bugger off to North Wales and hope it'll all go away. <laughs> so what's to be done? Well, elections, that's what's done, isn't it? We have representative democracy. We have political parties. I mean, we've just been through it, haven't we? That's how our system works. And all's going to be well now, isn't it? <clears throat> all of these problems that I've referred to. The NHS will be sorted, the schools will be sorted, legal aid will be sorted, public service. But actually it never is sorted. And some of you may well come at this with a firm political hat on. You know, you've always voted Conservative, always voted Labour. Um, and I used to believe in politics. I mean, there was a time when I really saw it as a force for beneficial change and I really got stuck in. And I've seen great liberating change, the provision of free universal contraception. I mean, people may not remember that. Uh, abortion, the legalization, to use the technical term, of homosexual acts by consenting adults. You know, this stuff used to be legal. This, I mean, huge, huge changes. And politics was about huge choices. Capitalism, 
versus socialism. Social justice versus inherited justice. Massive, massive arguments. But it's all been done. And it's ended in a scoring draw. You know, we have regulated market capitalism and social justice. And then you find that we now have what I term political cross-dressing as the parties seek to find distinctive space within a very compressed political playing field. You know, from hoodies, so we now find, who is it complaining the number of police has gone down? Was it the Conservatives or was it Labour? I can't quite remember, etc. And if you think about it, what is there left to argue about? We all want a world-class health service, good schools everywhere, <clears throat> high quality, right cost public services, balanced immigration, fair and productive taxes, sensible banking, etc, etc, etc. Politics is less and less about policy <coughs> and more and more about delivery. Stand and deliver. But unfortunately they're crap at it. But the reason they're crap at it is not because they are crap, but because the system in which they work is crap. And I hope you know we take all of our consulting thinking and we know that actually an awful lot at the root of what's wrong in any organisation is its organisation. It doesn't work and it never will. And if you hang your hat on politics, then uh, you'll be wasting an awful long time. So then we say, so why? You know, why doesn't it work? Why is it wrong? And I started on uh, this answer with a root cause analysis. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? being a good concern, <laughs> of why Labour lost the 2010 election. Very interesting. You could do, there, there were 19 reasons actually uh, in the intervening five years, you'll be pleased to know they've addressed two of them, uh, 17 years <laughs> ago. Um, and I was looking through an organisational, not a political lens. And the answers came back from, you know, government loss because it bought dirty banking, debt and spend economics, lax economic migration, poor delivery, reliance on legislation as an agent of change, leader wasn't going to win, old guard that hung on too long, and so on and so forth. But if you do your whys, did all of that happen, you know, your why whys, it all comes back to the constitution, uh, to the system of government, the constitution that, that arranges that system. And then you say, well, hang on, has this system ever been designed for its modern purposes? So when governments were being designed or, or, mm -hmm. or set up by the constitutional artifacts, rule of law, representative democracy, human rights, essentially, did we have a public sector spending 40% of GDP? No. Did we have globalised banking? No. Do we have immense decision complexity? No, etc, etc, etc. So you find that actually our system of government has never been designed for its modern purpose. By the way, neither is the EU. By the way, neither is the US. Switzerland's a bit better, but in general it has neither. So we have all of these governments around the world I mean, what's the biggest cock-up in the last 20 years in government? I would argue uh, setting up the euro without the proper uh, controls and disciplines and enforcement to make sure that that was going to work at the national level. Huge, huge cock-up. Precisely because none of the systems there would make them do it. And just to take one example of, of how an outcome like that, a cause like that, relates to um, uh, uh, the Constitution. Take Gordon Brown going into the last election. You know, why on earth would anyone go into an election with a leader they knew couldn't win? What you then find is that actually the Labour Party's <coughs> rules for challenging and replacing the leader are basically so opaque and difficult to manage that you more or less have to behave like FIFA choosing the next World Cup <laughs> and, and I kid you not, that, that's what happens in the parliamentary party. By contrast, the Conservatives have a very straightforward system and they have sound backbench governance. It's a thing called the 1922 Committee. Labour doesn't have one of those. 
And two years is about enough, isn't it, to work out if someone's going to uh, be credible electorally. And if it's not happening, tap on the shoulder, backbench committee has a bit of a chat, no knives come out. It's just like, the party is more important than you, please shift over, we'll give someone else a try. <coughs> so I looked further than having done that analysis of why policies fail uh, in the book at dodgy delivery of people failure. And putting all this together, how could these uh, failures be corrected or eliminated? And the answer is, we'll apply solid organisation and systems theory and practice. And if you do that, the first gaping hole in the system becomes apparent, which is feedback or its absence. So how does any organisation work when it's not got feedback on its outcomes? They can't function without them. And it's impossible. Can you imagine it? You imagine a major company, you know, we don't keep any information about what's happening about, you know, profit and loss, about sales, competitors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, we just do things. How can you uh, get that in feedback into the organisation to show you the way in which you want to change? Peter Drucker said in 1969, we need something much more urgently, the clear definition of the results a policy is expected to produce and the ruthless examination of these results against those expectations. This in turn that we spell out in considerable detail what results are expected rather than content ourselves with promises and manifestos. Does that mean two minutes left? Right. Um, you're supposed to tell me halfway through. I mean, it's I, what? I've been extemporising too much. So, so we have policies enacted, but they simply exist in the custody of a public service organisation, of a contract, of application of regulation, or whatever. But are these policies working? It's not a political question, or one for a self-scoring politician, but one that requires independent and objective scoring. We do get some feedback from the ONS, but it's a fraction of the whole. So if we're going to have that feedback, how are we going to make it happen? Well, you have to put that into a tamper-proof constitution where the government can't fiddle with it. And if you put it into that tamper-proof constitution, I think you've got three separations of powers, executive, judiciary and legislature. We need a fourth term I've come up with is a resulture. Um, clumsy name, anyone can think of a better one, then I'd love to hear it, but it needs to be um, separate. Who will do this? Well, the second chamber is the obvious answer, where uh, it has a responsibility as a check on government. Currently, it only does legislation. It's a legislation factory in a very nice tea shop, is what the House of Lords is. <laughs> and it's composed of 800 people. There are actually quite a good lot, uh, uh, apart from the near dead, that is. And it's, it's a sort of stakeholder chamber, but you get into the debates about House of Lords, and people are immediately arguing about the composition. All good consultants would ask the prior, consi prior question. What's its role? Oh, excuse me. What's its role? And then we can decide on its composition. So if you've got an apolitical check role, you can then set something up, I think, with 300 people on a stakeholder basis whose first job is to get stuck into results. People say, well, how much it will cost? Will it cost? And yeah, it will cost. But can you imagine a fraction of what it will save when you've got a league table? of legis all legislation with its cost and its effectiveness down two columns and you go through that in the way in which you would go through regulation and so on. And feedback buys you all sorts of other things as well because if you've tried to stitch up a policy for the benefit of someone, around the corner is waiting the results 
that are going to be measured not just in 10 years' time when someone gets off on a public campaign, but in a very short time. Feedback is about learning, about a learning organisation. Think about Peter Senge and the fifth discipline. It's about prioritising change, doing a lot less, uh, achieving a lot more. It provides some immunity from lobbying. It would actually provide real power for politicians uh, at last, because more would actually be done rather than not. We would get a lot better service out of it. And uh, I'll just toss this one in. Uh, it, it would be the answer to silos, uh, which has been uh, a, a problem in government for as long as anyone can remember. There are four other major components of the system. One is policy vetting. I really don't believe that policies, you know, we need any more just to do policies on the basis of uh, what a minister thought in the bath, what I said to him on the train, uh, a bit of ideology, the demands of the 24-hour news. I mean, as consultants, don't we know much more about how to take good decisions than that? Um, there's operations and delivery with zero defects. There's what I've called fit people. Uh, and competitive democracy. Democracy is about competition. The tougher the competition, the higher the standards. By the way, did you know in order to get elected Prime Minister this time, you only needed to be better than Ed Miliband? <laughs> Some worried thought. By the way, just, I mean, give me this one, Ben, I'm, and then I will finish. Um, uh, the other thing uh, I've learned recently about people from Eton um, is that we should all be aware that their confidence uh, far exceeds their talent. Um, <laughs> you'll find all of this in the book. Um, I've turned it a treaty of government. I, I mean, I do, aside from the jokes, I do think this is really, really important. Uh, and I do think uh, we need to grip this. And I do think uh, it will only get worse. Um, there are various... Uh, suggestions in the book as to the way people can do things and get involved. Um, whether, you know, we're going to have to, mm -hmm. Master, we're going to have to set up uh, our own political party in order to take this agenda forward. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, if, if that's the proposition on the floor, then I very much welcome it. Um, I, I do also believe that this is uh, quality of government. I mean, obviously, it's an issue of global competitiveness, you know, it's not just a nice to have, the world just is getting more and more competitive. So that, so that if you like, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a negative reason for doing it, a fear reason, but I think also it's about time we embrace the concept that actually government has the capability to be really, really good. Um, and we can have a thing that I would call a renaissance government. And if we do have a thing called Renaissance government, then I think we can all have a really, really good time. Thank you very much.